In the dying days of the Third Reich, German engineers proposed a dive bomber so extreme it defied logic and vision. The Hütte Hu 136 was sleek, fast, and terrifyingly blind. Designed without a windshield or forward-facing canopy, it asked pilots to dive toward targets using nothing but instruments and nerve. No horizon, no visuals, just numbers on a dial. While most aircraft aimed to improve visibility, the Hu-136 eliminated it. A radical gamble born from glider mines and wartime desperation, this was aviation at its most unhinged. Because sometimes flying blind wasn't a metaphor, it was the entire design philosophy. Germany's Desperate Sky Gambles By 1943, the Luftwaffe was bleeding altitude, aircraft and confidence. Allied air forces were dominating the skies, launching devastating bombing raids deeper into German territory. The Ju-87 Stuka, the pride of early Blitzkrieg, was now a flying anachronism. Too slow, too vulnerable, too outdated to survive in contested airspace. Germany's Air Command, the RLM, knew the age of lumbering dive bombers was over. They needed something faster, meaner, impossible to hit. A strike aircraft that could dive, destroy, and disappear. This wasn't just about tactics, it was about survival. The Reich's war economy depended on protecting armament factories, bridges, and supply lines from the Allies' relentless air onslaught. Enter a series of new competitions. Radical proposals were invited from across Germany's aviation sector. Conventional wisdom was shelved in favor of revolutionary thinking. Could a new kind of dive bomber change the course of the war? The requirements were simple in words, but brutal in reality. High-speed dive, pinpoint strike capability, rapid recovery, minimal vulnerability. Every company scrambled for solutions. Junkers proposed the Ju-187, a redesigned Stuka with a tail that swiveled. Blohm and Voss offered asymmetry. Volker Wolf considered turbojets. But one proposal came from an unlikely source. Two glider specialists who had no mass production experience but a flair for the unthinkable. The Hütter brothers didn't come with a factory. They came with an idea. And that idea would terrify anyone who dared imagine flying it. Enter the Hütter brothers. Glider royalty turns radical. Wolfgang and Ulrich Hütter were not conventional aircraft designers. They were soaring pioneers, masters of silent flight. Gliders were their world, machines that whispered through the clouds, using only nature's lift and perfect geometry. But in the wartime crucible of 1944, the Reich didn't need silence. It needed shock. And the Hütters were ready to deliver. Their glider routes gave them a unique edge. Efficiency aerodynamics, purity of design. Where others saw horsepower, they saw airflow. Where others bolted on armor, they shaped the fuselage to become the shield. The Hu-136 wasn't an aircraft, it was a philosophy. A narrow, tubular body, swept back wings, and a cockpit so far recessed into the fuselage that the pilot couldn't even see forward. Not directly, not ever. To the Hütters, vision was optional. What mattered was drag, minimizing it to create a bullet of aluminum and steel that could punch through the sky. Their design didn't just break the rules, it discarded them entirely. Every part of the Hu-136 reflected a glider maker's obsession with streamlining. Even the bomb was carried internally, released in a vertical dive. No drag, no drag at all. Their proposal stunned the RLM. It looked like a missile with wings, no glass nose, no windshield, just a metal shell with a man buried inside, flying by numbers and blind faith. Most dismissed it as fantasy, but the Hütters believed they'd found the future of air-to-ground combat, one that replaced pilot vision with precision and human instinct with cold engineering. Design or Madness? The Windshield Less Wonder No windshield, no front canopy, 
no forward view. That was the Who 136's signature and its sin. The cockpit was buried deep within the fuselage, set so far back that the pilot's eyes aligned with nothing but metal. There were no clear sight lines, just a periscope mounted to the side of the canopy, giving the illusion of forward visibility. But illusions don't guide dive angles. Instruments did. The Hutters believed that by eliminating the cockpit bulge and frontal glazing, they could reduce drag and increase structural integrity. It made sense on paper. The pilot would enter a steep dive using gyro instruments, release the payload, and pull out using timed recovery, never needing to see the target directly. Theoretically, it meant faster dives, tighter tolerances, and lower radar signature. In reality, it meant flying with your eyes closed. The design rejected every instinct a pilot had. Visibility wasn't limited, it was eradicated. Peripheral awareness? Gone. Target confirmation? Guesswork. In a dive bomber, the entire concept is built on lining up the target visually and timing the drop. The WHO 136 dared to do away with that. Its sleek fuselage tapered into a sharp nose, uninterrupted by canopy or framing. The pilot was a passenger to mathematics. While other aircraft were adding reinforced glass and armoured bubble canopies, the Hu-136 was stripping it all away. Its design wasn't just unconventional, it was unsettling. A warplane that relied more on numbers than nerves, one where seeing the battlefield was considered unnecessary. The Hutters had created something so optimised it scared even the engineers reviewing it. A bomber built not for pilots, but for perfection. If it worked, it would be revolutionary. If not, it was suicide wrapped in aluminum. Specs, speed and staggering choices. At its core, the Hu-136 was built around brute force and elegant speed. Powering this radical shape was the legendary BMW 801 radial engine, the same beast that roared in the nose of the FW-190. It delivered 1,700 horsepower through 14 cylinders of air-cooled fury. But unlike the FW-190, the Hu-136 didn't have the luxury of robust forward airflow. Its tight fuselage made engine cooling another risk stacked against it. The design incorporated dive brakes, reinforced structure and internal bomb storage. Everything pointed toward maximum aerodynamic performance. Its estimated top speed, nearly 670 km per hour, 416 miles per hour, incredibly fast for a dive bomber. It would have made the Ju-87 look like a barn door with wings. The bomb was carried internally and released at the nadir of a vertical dive. Recovery would be violent. Estimates predicted pull-out G-forces of up to 8 or 9 Gs, depending on dive angle and speed. For a pilot flying blind, trusting instruments, that's not just intense, it's lethal territory. Armament options included a single large bomb or twin smaller payloads. Defensive guns? None. It was a pure hit-and-run machine. No tail gunner, no second chances. The airframe was designed to take damage and escape, not linger. Its airframe was tested in wind tunnels and reportedly handled airflow like a glider on fire. On paper, it was spectacular. In practice, it was a high-speed puzzle, one that assumed nothing would ever go wrong. Because if it did, the pilot wouldn't even see it coming. Why the Who 136 terrified its own engineers. The Who 136 wasn't just radical, it was unnerving. Even on the drawing board, engineers whispered concerns that never made it into the official reports. Visibility wasn't poor, it was non-existent. Test pilots called it a metal coffin long before a prototype was ever built, and the idea of executing a precision vertical dive using only instruments gave even veteran air crews vertigo. Simulated flight profiles raised alarming questions. In turbulent combat conditions, a single moment of instrument lag could throw off bomb timing. 
The periscope, which was supposed to provide forward visibility, struggled in wind tunnel mock-ups. Turbulence created distorted views, shaking the tiny mirror system violently. You could line up the dive, or you could guess. Even worse, the RLM realized that friendly anti-aircraft units wouldn't be able to identify the Hu-136 quickly enough. Its bizarre silhouette and lack of clear cockpit made it look like a hostile drone, or worse, an allied prototype. Trigger-happy gunners will shoot it down before the enemy does, one memo warned. Internally, there were deeper concerns. The recessed cockpit made escape almost impossible, no ejection seat, no fast bailout system. If the engine failed, the pilot might not even see where to land, if there was even time to try. The Luftwaffe High Command was deeply divided. Some admired the innovation, others called it a death trap. When shown models of the aircraft, test pilot Hans Zander reportedly said, it's fast, but is it blind or suicidal? Either way, the RLM hesitated, and in wartime Germany, Hesitation was the kiss of death for a design. The Hu-136 became a ghost, a project haunted by the very brilliance that birthed it. It wasn't shot down. It was buried under its own ambition. Why the Hu-136 lost the race in the competitive free-for-all of late-war German aircraft design, the Hu-136 was never alone. It faced stiff competition, not from enemies, but from its own side. The RLM had also solicited proposals from the major players, Junkers, Volkerwolf, Blohm and Voss. Everyone had ideas, but most played it safe. The Ju-187, Junkers' successor to the Stuka, retained a pilot's view. Focke-Wulf leaned into turbojet research, the Hu-136. It asked the Luftwaffe to embrace darkness. But bold doesn't mean adopted. The Reich favoured pragmatism over genius. The Hu-136 was revolutionary, yes, but also high risk, low production, and utterly unfamiliar. Wartime factories couldn't afford experimental. They needed adaptable. Existing designs were easier to modify, parts easier to share. The Hu-136 offered none of that. No proven flight record, no shared components, and no pilot training pipeline that prepared aviators to dive without seeing. And then came the jets. As the Mi-262 entered production, priorities shifted. Prop-driven bombers, even radical ones, suddenly felt obsolete. The Hu-136 wasn't just too advanced for its time, it was now irrelevant to it. The RLM quietly shelved the project. No prototype ever flew, no fuselage ever left the ground. Its obituary was a footnote. Officially, not suitable for further development. Unofficially, it was too strange, too blind and too bold. In a sky filling with jets and desperation, the Hu-136 became the aviation equivalent of a whispered legend. A ghost of what might have been, outpaced by both logic and the future. Legacy of a Ghost Today, the Hu-136 exists only in blueprints, models and memory. No airframes were built, no engines were ever mounted, it never saw combat, but its legacy still haunts aviation history because it represents something few aircraft ever do, a complete rejection of conventional flight logic. To aerospace historians, the Hu-136 is a case study in wartime extremism. It showed what could happen when designers, unburdened by tradition, were told to break everything and start from zero. And break it, they did. Modern stealth aircraft borrow similar logic, internal payloads, smooth profiles, reduced visibility. But even the B-2 spirit lets its pilots see the sky. The Ho-136 dared to go a step further, it hid the pilot away like cargo, trusting calculations over consciousness. While it left no physical remains, it left a conceptual shadow. 
the idea that flight doesn't need to follow instinct, that pilots can surrender their senses to design. It was a glider maker's vision turned deadly. And though it never flew, the Hu-136 still soars in the minds of those who study the fine line between genius and madness. The Hu-136 wasn't built to be flown, it was built to be believed in. It asked pilots to abandon vision, instinct and fear, and replace them with trust in dials, math and metal. It was less a machine, more a theory made real. One that said, maybe we don't need to see to strike. But war wasn't ready for that kind of faith. The Reich needed certainty. The Hu-136 offered none. Today, its name is a whisper in hangars and history books. But its design still asks a chilling question. How much can you sacrifice in the name of performance? In this case, the answer was vision itself. If this ghost of a dive bomber fascinated you, drop a like, hit subscribe, and tell us, should we cover the Heinkel P-1079? Or maybe the Soviet BI-1 rocket interceptor? Comment below and ring the bell because we're just getting started uncovering the war machines that almost rewrote history.